Welcome to Nomad PHP Lightning Talks. I'm Joe Ferguson. Nomad PHP Lightning Talks are 10 minute talks that give a high level overview or an in depth look at a small portion of a PHP related topic. Lightning Talks are a great way for new speakers to build their speaking resume and for longtime speakers to test drive new talk ideas. If you'd like to give a 10 minute Lightning Talk, please email me at joe at nomadphp.com. Right now we have Christopher Pitt and he'll be talking about typed PHP. Please make sure you visit Joined In after the talk and leave Christopher some feedback. Christopher, here we go. I'm going to make you a presenter. Thanks, Joe. There you go. Shut that in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Everything look good? Yeah, you look good. All right. So, um, Thanks. Today I'm going to talk briefly about alternative type management in PHP. Uh, so not memory management or languages similar to PHP with different type systems, but specifically some object-oriented things and extensions that you can use to make stronger typing in your PHP code. Um, before I start, I just want to say that all of this comes from a book that I've written called Type PHP. And if you're a Nomad subscriber, then you'll probably get access to a free copy of this in the near future. So look out for that if this interests you. Okay, so PHP types. Let's have a look at how they work currently and some of the uh, some of the dealings with them that are perhaps less than ideal, uh, so that we can understand how to use them better and how to perhaps improve upon our use of them. Uh, so the first notable thing is that PHP uh, has weak types, or sometimes called loose types. And for the purposes of this talk, those words are interchangeable. Um, so some languages force you to decide on a type of data a variable can hold. But PHP isn't one of these languages. Uh, for example, you can declare variables that don't have a type. You can change their type at any time. And an example in code of this would be, well, we can assign user ID one to a variable dollar user and immediately assign a username to it. And PHP just doesn't care, uh, which is sometimes a strength, but sometimes it's not. Now, PHP manages to do this uh, via structures called ZVALs. They hold va um, the values of variables, they hold the types of variables, and some reference counting information. Uh, they look kind of like this. Now, the reference counting information has to do with garbage collection, which is the memory management model that PHP interpreter uses by default. And we're not too fussed right now about how that works, but what interests us more is that the type of the variable is, well, variable as much as the data. That leaves us in a tiny bit of a pickle when it comes to deciding what type a variable contains. So PHP has equality, the equal symbols. Uh, it also has a few methods to help us identify whether things are strings or integers or booleans. Um, but it's not always convenient to have to pick between which of those to use, especially if we don't know which one we need. Uh, examples of this, well, if we use double equals, then the first line is true because true is converted to one or one is converted to true. I can't remember which one it is, but what's going on there is called type coercion or type juggling. Um, that happens because the comparison needs to be made between data of the same types, so PHP will convert one of those into the same type as the other so that the comparison can be made. Now we can use triple equals um, and that will do no type conversion. So what it's checking is not only the value but also the type. They need to be the same. Another thing uh, that you may be familiar with if you've used a lot of PHP uh, and type theory around it is that PHP has this concept called type hinting, which is basically you telling functions in PHP what types of variables they should expect. Uh, so this helps the compiler or the interpreter to prevent type errors. So if you're trying to concatenate strings but one of them is a float, well, uh, you know, type hinting would be able to identify those kinds of things. Um, but unfortunately, type hinting is not supported on scalar types. So it is supported on classes and interfaces and even arrays and callables. But when it comes to doing things like strings or integers, we can't type in for those. We have to do assertions or throw exceptions and use functions like is underscore string and is underscore integer. There are also various inconsistencies with the core functionality surrounding how we use types in PHP. 
So some of them are down to simple things like the names. If you go to the PHP online manual, you'll see 98 string functions used. And uh, the first comparison I made was that 30 of them have underscores in them. So 30 of these 98 functions, string functions, have multiple words, and those words are separated by underscores, whereas the other 68 don't. Uh, also, 55 of them use abbreviated words, while the other 43 don't. And there are various ways to debate which are abbreviated and which aren't. But the main thing I want to bring across here is that there are inconsistencies between different functions and how they're expressed within the core functionality of PHP. Another weird inconsistency is argument order. So have you ever heard of the old needle haystack problem? Of course you have. And what you may or may not know already is that it's reducible mostly to arrays being needle haystack in parameter order and strings being haystack needle in parameter order, except when it's not. So there are some incredible examples of functions which do very similar things where the argument order is unpredictable. So the difference there is, in this case, is map, where the callable comes first, and in filter and reduce, the array comes first. Having a look at some string functions, uh, and, and bear in mind, these examples are not necessarily just about looking for needles within haystacks. That's the name of the problem, but the actual problem itself is that parameters that you would expect in an intuitive, consistent order are not. So if all of your operations need to work on a primary parameter, which is a string, or a primary parameter, which is an array, well, they're in different orders the whole time. Here, if we want to search for a string, a uh, needle within a haystack, haystack's first. In explode, haystack's second. In string replace, haystack's third. That's pretty weird. Not easy to get. The last inconsistency I want to look at um, with a lot of the functionality in PHP is that return types are not always the values that you think they are. And in addition to that, that the manual's not always clear. And I have one really cool example of this, and it's the preg match function. So preg match returns one if a pattern uh, matches a given subject, zero if it doesn't, or false if there was an error. Think about that for a second. One if a pattern matches, zero if it doesn't, or false if there's not an error. Now remember, PHP is a weekly type language, so zero can be coerced into false. But by the way, there is this note there as well, which says that the function may return a Boolean false, but it also may return a non-Boolean false, which evaluates to false. So it could return, according to the manual, a zero, which is the same as what's returned for no match found. And the only way to get around this, if you see a zero, is to use another function call to check if there was, in fact, an error. And that's weird. That's really bizarre. So what can we do to make things a little more consistent while introducing stronger typing for projects that really need it? Uh, one option is that we can use boxing. So what it is is that we take classes and we wrap primitives within them. Um, we make a class like a string object. Uh, for example, I've got one here. Make a string object and we pass the string data into it through the constructor. And then we have a function to resolve that data out later on. So when we create it, we say a string is a new string object, give it a string object. And one of the big benefits here is that we can start to add methods on top of the string object class. So we can start to do things like reverse into uppercase and, uh, and add explode and you know, add methods onto these strings, which are typically scalar objects and can't have methods on them. We can extend it to an API that's familiar to us. And we can also type in these because they're classes, and PHP supports type in classes. So boxing is an option but it requires special construction and deconstruction. We have to say new string object, and we have to get the value back out of that class when we want to do a string operation. Uh, I also said it allows type hinting, so that's a good thing to bear in mind. A step further than this is there's an, ext there's an extension called scalar types. It's created by a very clever chap named Nikita Popov, and uh, it's the same concept. So we create classes that wrap primitives, but this has an extra cool side effect that it has automatic construction and deconstruction. So we create our object, we add methods to it, bearing in mind that dollar this will evaluate to a string value. So we can just use normal string methods there. And then we register this class. And what happens then is every subsequent string we do, we just say dollar string is a new string value, and we can start using those methods on there as if it was an object, which is really cool. Now, so it does the automatic construction and deconstruction. Um, it doesn't allow type hinting yet. 
which is a problem because then you still have to do our assertions inside our functions and you can't opt out of it. Once you registered it, every string you make will have these object properties. Um, so that's not always great. And it is an extra extension that you need to that you need to compile and install in addition to PHP. A similar extension is called SPL types. Hands up if you've uh, if you've heard of SPL. Mm, that's a joke because I can't see your hands, but Mostly when people talk about SPL, they talk about iterators, they talk about array-like structures, and SPL is also where we get things like the SPL uh, autoload register functions and the array object class. But a really underused side of SPL is these SPL types. It's a series of classes, things for string, boolean, float, integer, enumerator, and uh, we can subclass these in the same way that we created classes for scalar types or for boxing. Um, So let's look at an example. You can use the normal SPL string, but generally I think what you want to do is extend it, uh, subclass it, and then add your own functionality. Again, dollar this refers to uh, will be evaluated to the string value or the float value, whichever SPL class you subclass. And you do need to construct this specially. So it doesn't automatically get wide in when you create new strings like scalar types does. You have to construct it, but it'll automatically deconstruct. So it'll automatically resolve to a string if you're using it in a string operation. So it requires the special construction, like we had with normal boxing, um, but it has automatic deconstruction or resolution. Uh, it allows type hinting, type hinting, because now these are instances of classes. They deconstruct themselves well, but they're still instances of classes, so we can type hint them. Uh, and I think a benefit here is that you must opt in to use these. So you can use this extension in conjunction with normal code. It doesn't break behavior that's already there. It'll, you know, if you code towards this extension, only the code that you've done towards that will be affected, which is pretty cool. And really, this is my favorite uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I like that I like that it's a special opt-in thing. Uh, and even though it's an extra extension, a lot of good work's been done into extension managers like Pickle, so that's not really the biggest problem. But in addition to the behavior that scalar types does, this allows you to type hint as well which is really awesome. It supports fewer types. Scalar type supports seven different things, so strings and floats and integers and res uh, resources and nulls and all sorts of things. Scalar types just does string and float and integer and boolean and enum, I think, uh, are the main ones. So it supports fewer types, but actually I think it's less invasive, so I prefer it. Uh, now, optional types, no talk about type theory would be complete without a look at optional types, even a brief one. So, so optional types are classes that wrap classes. This is often called uh, um, the null object pattern. So it's this idea that you wrap behavior inside another class, um, usually structured as a monad, which in itself is an awesome discussion, but for another time, I guess. Um, but you put values inside these, or you put class instances inside of these optional types. And then when you call methods on them, if the methods return null, you don't get null errors. Uh, you can handle those better. So let's look at an example of how this works. Um, in this non-optional type code, I'm getting a user. Uh, I check if the user is not null, and then I get the address. Same with address. If it's not null, I get the city. If the city is not null, I get the forecast, and then I print the forecast. The trouble is that at each step, we need to do null checking. Was the user null? OK, not so we can continue. Also, what happens when one of those does return null? Well, we've got a roadblock in the way of our functionality. So it'll be a lot cooler if we could do something like this. So wrap the initial starting point in an optional type and then just chain methods on it. So user address, and that'll call the address method on, on the user that was returned. If it's not null, it'll pass that value to the next method call and so forth and so forth. And then we can use callbacks to wire into that functionality, whether there is a value, whether it's empty. Uh, but this provides us a way to avoid all the type checking and potential errors that happen with null types, which is pretty awesome. Um, now, there's a, type theory is a really broad topic, uh, and we've only just just touched on it. Um, optional types, especially, there's a lot more that they can do, and they're very expressive, but there's just not enough time. Where you can learn more? Well, you can if you're not already following Anthony Ferreira or IRC Maxwell on Twitter, then you really should be, because he writes a lot of cool PHP posts. Recently, he wrote one called What About Garbage, which explains PHP garbage collection and 
takes a tiny peek into how the variables work, those evals that I spoke about earlier. So that's a really good post to do. But follow him on Twitter because he's cool. Uh, Igor Wheeler uh, who is an exceptionally clever chap who also is very good at PHP. Um, both these guys have been on Nomad before as well, by the way. Um, so you can check out their talks in the archives, I guess. Um, anyway, Igor recently wrote a series of articles on functional libraries, and one of them explains in much greater detail than we have time for now uh, how these optional types work, the reasons that you would want to use them, and looks at some practical implementations of them. So check that out as well. And then uh, last and least, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I tweet about this kind of stuff a lot, and as I mentioned, with the book, there'll be links and references to there, so you can get example code and implementation libraries and all that kind of cool stuff. And also talk about robotics and Minecraft and other crazy PHP stuff. So um, if you're keen for that. Uh, and lastly, please want you leave feedback on the joined in page for this talk because it's really helpful for organizers and for me to know where we need to improve on this. Uh, and that's it. All right, thanks for joining us for another Nomad PHP Lightning Talk. If you'd like to give a Lightning Talk, please email me, joe at nomadphp.com. Please make sure you visit Joined In and leave Christopher some feedback. <laughs>